melodic percussion instrument from the island of Trinidad in the South Caribbean. Many know this beautiful instrument's unique sound, but are unfamiliar with the instrument itself, let alone the rich and intriguing history of the instrument and the culture from which it sprang. The steel pan is a melodic percussion instrument invented in the mid-20th century in Trinidad. Steel pans were originally created by beating the bottom of a 55-gallon oil drum into a concave shape and then creating distinct pitch regions. Today, the pitches on tenor steel pans are typically arranged in a circle of fifths, with the larger areas around the outside being lower in pitch and getting higher as you progress toward the middle of the pan. There are four basic types of steel pans. Tenors, or leads. Doubles. Triples. And bases. And these categories can be further broken down. For example, there are double tenors and double seconds, each filling a particular role in the larger ensemble. A steel band functions similarly to an orchestra or a four-part choir. The tenors usually play the melody. The doubles and triples either harmonize the melody or accompany it by playing chords, which is called comping, or playing a repeated rhythmic figure, often with multiple pitches, kind of like a guitarist strumming. The basses play the bass lines, which can be either simple or complex, that ground the rest of the ensemble. In addition to the various different types of steel pans, steel bands usually have a drum set and something called an engine room. Engine room is the name for the collective auxiliary percussion instruments that help keep the beat of the piece, while often taking on a bit of a voice themselves. One of the most important parts of the engine room is called the iron. The iron is an old brake drum that is used to play a constant pulse that drives the band forward. Together, these different sections come together to play a variety of different pieces of music. Steel bands are not limited to any one particular genre and play many different kinds of music, from traditional Trinidadian music styles like calypso and soca, to arrangements of classical pieces or pop music songs, called bomb tunes, and original pieces written specifically for steel band. Today, the steel pan is the national instrument of Trinidad and can be heard not only in the context of steel bands, both inside and outside Trinidad, but is used in a variety of different musical settings and in different musical styles, from jazz tunes to hip hop beats. But how did the steel pan come to be? The steel pan has its origins in West African musical instruments. When African slaves were captured and sent to Trinidad, they brought with them what they could, which was not much. In Africa, music was used for all kinds of things, from marking the changing of seasons to signaling for a hunt to begin. One of the oldest instruments brought over from Africa was the talking drum. Shaped like an hourglass and covered in animal skin, these drums were held under one arm and beat with a stick with the other. The drum could be squeezed by the holding arm, changing the sounding pitch after being struck. These drums were used to imitate the language of different tribes and could literally be used as a form of communication. These drums were particularly effective over long distances. When they arrived in Trinidad, African slaves were sold to plantation owners. Every effort was made to make sure that no two Africans from the same tribe would go to the same plantation, in order to reduce the amount of communication that could happen between slaves. Music and drumming, however, remained a major part of slaves' lives. Drumming was especially useful during these times to keep energy up and morale high while working. African slaves realized the importance of rhythm and its power and ability to keep the human spirit going. Carnival celebrations in Trinidad were a key place where Africans could find some reprieve from the strenuous and exhausting work they were forced to do. Carnival was originally celebrated in Trinidad by the French. Carnival, celebrated in the days leading up to Lent, comes from the Latin phrase carnivale, or farewell to meat signifying the fast that would occur during Lent. This could also be read as farewell to flesh, 
and signify more the worry-free atmosphere of the celebrations. French plantation owners would celebrate Carnival with elaborate balls, decked out in costumes and makeup. Slaves were excluded from these activities, largely because there were often parades through the streets where the French owners would masquerade as slaves, pretending to be them and imitating their drumming songs and dances. The French knew this would likely incite violence, and therefore kept the African slaves out of the loop. The slaves would hold their own celebrations, though. In their own homes and backyards, slaves found time to celebrate their culture while at the same time making fun of their masters. They would engage in activities from their homeland, including mask-making and costuming. Music and drumming were a large part of the celebrations as well. After the British seized control of Trinidad in 1797, anti-slavery sentiments were prevalent. As abolitionist movements were on the rise in Britain, and as a result, slavery was finally abolished in Trinidad in 1834. To celebrate, the newly freed Africans paraded through the streets reenacting a Canbalay march that they would have been forced to do while under slavery. Canbalay, from the French can brûlé, meaning burning cane, refers to the necessary process of burning sugarcane that happens right before it is harvested. The slaves were forced to do the harvesting and were whipped through the streets on the way to the fields. After emancipation, freed slaves performed a canbalay march to celebrate, taking something that had been used to keep them down and turning it into a celebration of their freedom, which is still enacted today. Around the same time in the mid-19th century, gangs of stick fighters began forming. This stick fighting, known as kalinda, is a form of African martial art that often involves music and dance. These rival gangs would engage in stick fights that, although meant for entertainment, would often end in bloodshed. In the 1880s, sick of the violence and obscene costumes involved in Carnival and Canbule, Arthur Baker, chief of police in Port of Spain at the time, led a large group of policemen to attack a group of celebrators who fought back. This went on for hours, and eventually came to be known as the Canbule Riots. Tensions between government officials and the freed slaves continued to rise until it came to a head in 1883, when, after a particularly violent carnival celebration that year, a law was passed that banned singing, dancing, drumming, and other music making. All use of drumming was banned, along with the use of any other noisy instrument. Trinidadians would not be kept down, though. They found different ways to celebrate and express themselves. One of the first replacements for the hand drums was tambu bamboo. The term tambu bamboo comes from the French word for drum, tambour, and the material used for the drumming. Players would all have different lengths of bamboo and would either strike the side of the piece or hit the bamboo against the ground, creating a variety of sounds that they were able to use in place of traditional drums. Tambu bamboo was the most commonly used instrument in carnival celebrations for quite some time, especially at the turn of the 20th century. Eventually, tambu bamboo was also banned for the same reasons that skin drums were banned. Publicly, the reason given for the banning was that the bamboo tubes were occasionally used by gang members as weapons against other gangs within Trinidad, and that the bamboo was being harvested illegally. But this was just another way for the colonial rulers to maintain their hegemonic power, as government officials sought to keep the Trinidadians in an extended form of the conditions they were under during slavery, preventing them from using anything to communicate or express themselves. Within Tambu Bamboo Bands, some people would play pieces of scrap metal or other similar pieces of trash found lying around. If a player's bamboo broke during a carnival parade, they would simply pick up something near them, usually something like a brake drum, garbage can lid, or later, a hubcap, in order to keep playing. Players began to enjoy the sound of these metallic objects more than the bamboo, as they created a better, more striking sound, and the use of metal instruments increased over time, leading to Trinidad's Iron Age beginning in the 1930s.
As these metal objects were played more and more, they would become dented in particular ways, and in some cases would actually produce a musical tone. From these humble origins, the modern steel pan was born. Early on, biscuit tins were used as a main source for the creation of these instruments, but eventually 55-gallon oil drums were used. These drums were prevalent and easy to come by on the island because the U.S. Navy had set up oil refineries in Trinidad, creating a large amount of excess waste that Trinidadians were able to use to their benefit. Through much experimentation and the inventiveness of major steel pan innovators, such as Winston Spree Simon, who invented the first ping-pong steel pan named for the sound it makes, Ellie Minette, who gave the instrument its concave shape to make it easier to play, Anthony Williams, who organized the pitches on the pan by intervals of fourths and fifths, and Bertie Marshall, who gave the steel pan its signature sound by making developments in harmonic tuning, the instrument evolved to be more musical and more durable. In the early days, steel pan was a way for these young black men to find community, creating friendships between each other while they were creating the steel pan. The instrument was a way for marginalized Trinidadians to cope with the oppressive authoritative powers in Trinidad and come together as a way of supporting each other and dealing with poor living conditions. Through this act of bonding, this marginalized community ended up creating a national art form. As these instruments began to become more varied and grow in popularity, steel bands began to form. These early bands were not well organized were typically smaller and would play simple tunes as they marched through the streets. The steel pan had now become the sound of celebration in Trinidad, with steel pans featured prominently in carnival celebrations, taking over for the outlawed Tambu Bamboo. Despite this rise in popularity, steel pan was still considered a nuisance by many, and steel bands were often dismantled by local authorities looking to keep panists quiet. This was due to the complaints of middle-class Trinidadians, as well as the fact that steel bands often engaged in violent gang-related activity in rivalries with other bands. In a letter to the Trinidad Guardian, C.W. Clark wrote, We must put up with the transformation of earth into bedlam, to the utter disgust of parents, students, tired workmen, troubled people, and invalids. Can-beating is pan-beating in any language and in any form. It does nobody any good, and when it is indulged in all day, all night, day in and day out, it is abominable. Why is there no legislation to control it? If it must continue, and if by virtue of its alleged inherent beauty and charm it will some day bring popularity and fame to the island, and a fortune to the beaters, then by all means let it go on, but in the forest and other desolate places. Pan playing was an illegal act for quite some time, and the steel pan continued to be criminalized by local authorities, just like the talking drums and tambu bamboo before it. Zigali Constantine, who went to jail in 1940 because he was playing pan, said, Well, the police was against pan, and anybody they see with a pan, they're going to beat ya and lock ya up. We had to battle with them because, you know, I definitely was from a poor family. We had nothing, and the onlyest thing we get was this little thing to play, and the police was against that. Boy, and they would had to kill we because it was all we had. It was peaceful and quiet. As much as the pressure was, nobody used to thief and thing. But when these police come in and start to pile the pressure on, they turn everybody beast. Because we didn't, that we shouldn't get locked for that at all. Just pan. Eventually, however, the value of the steel pan was recognized, and it became the national instrument of Trinidad and Tobago. The steel pan was used as the main accompaniment to carnival celebrations for many years until it began to be replaced by trucks carrying speakers blasting the music louder than a steel band could play. The steel pan wouldn't go anywhere, though, and its popularity within the country led to the creation of Panorama, a steel band competition in 1963. This competition, which is still happening today, 
sees different sized steel bands from all over the country coming together to compete for this top spot. Each band's leader arranges a calypso from the current year with different variations and twists, and spends the whole year working hard to perfect their performance to win the judges' hearts. Today, the steel pan has become a truly global instrument, as the steel pan and steel bands can be found all over the world. Many steel bands outside Trinidad continue to keep some of these old traditions and customs that come from the culture that created the pan. What, what I like about steel band is that it isn't like a giant concert band, it's like a bunch of people. It's a small group of people. There's like, like, there's like 11 or so of us, right? Or something like that. So you have time to get to know each person and get to like uh, talk with them and you're always, you're always around new people. And so you're always trying new things and you're always around new people and you're able to talk to them and ask for help about music. And it's just very easy in steel band to make new friends. My favorite thing about being in a steel band is probably the atmosphere. It's one of the least judgmental environments I've ever been in, um, regardless of the group or where it is. Um, the only drama I've ever experienced in steel bands is like when we were when Maroon Steel was transitioning from being a class to being a, an organization. But even then, I mean, we did it. It's still alive today. Like that's amazing. I think the way that I would describe it would be making like cool new music with people that uh, you don't necessarily know them very well, but you know that you guys are all friends. Honestly, it's probably just being able to walk down like cross the street or walk down military walk and you see someone from Rune Steel and you wave at them and they wave back. Rune Steel is <laughs> definitely a place where people can come in and not know anyone and play an instrument. And I think a social aspect is that people in other in other scenarios, people might feel pressure to make friends very quickly, but because everyone is still focused on that one main focus, which is the music in the end, like, can't we play this music? Like, how do I play this music? Um, the idea of, like, being a part of that community just kind of comes in the longer you're here, and the more you interact with Marin Steel. There's, some, there's something about Marin's, like, just playing steel drums that just it's just fun. It's it, it's just like it's just a way to like express enjoyment and have like have a good time, even if the rest of your life is not exactly as fun as as, as when you as it feels when you're playing steel drums. I like the mood that it sends people in, and I think that doesn't have to be Jimmy Buffett, but I like I think people really like the steel drums and it's really novel, and so they really kind of take into a different place by the music. Mm and they, they have an experience not just sitting back and listening to a, an ensemble, but almost being on an island or being yeah. somewhere tropical. Yeah, as far as like being in a band in general, it's for me that's the best feeling because I can sit down at my house and practice all I want, but there's a different feeling, whether it's with Praise Band, Steel Pan, uh, Steel Pan Band, or a couple you know, of the, the other kind of bands I've played with in, in previous years, it is always better for me to play music with people because you know, I, I, like I said, I can sit down and play to a backing track or, you know, a, a song I want to play to all the time. But for me, as far as when I'm playing drums or any kind of other instrument in steel pans, there's no better feeling than playing with people because it just, it's a different, uh, it's a different environment. It feels better playing every note I hit, so. Um, so I know I came to rehearsal like a couple weeks late because I kind of sat on it for a little bit. And I was like, I don't know if I actually want to do this. And I decided to go to a rehearsal one day and I met a couple people um, who were like really welcoming. And I was like, it, can I still be in it? And they were like, yeah, here's some music. You can learn it right now. And I don't know, everybody was just like really welcoming. So I decided to stick around and it was really fun. First guy I met in Red Steel was Alonzo. He kind of opened up the fam for me. And uh, yeah, it's just been awesome ever since. Kind of threw me into the fire at the beginning because y'all were just like, here's a part, start playing. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> the history, but more of the uh, like social aspect that comes from being in the band. Mm -hmm. 
sort of the uh, the liming right. that we that you talked about, and then we were all like, "What? What is liming?" And you were like, "Oh, it's like you know when people when people in the steel band they hang out together and they get to know each other, and you know it makes the whole experience a lot better because you're playing music with people that you know and people that you like." The most ex- uh, significant liming experience I had with Myrn Steel, I remember. Um, I think it was close to Halloween. We went over to one of the um, band members' apartments and we watched Nightmare Before Christmas all together. It had nothing to do with Steel Band at all, but you know, again, going into another kind of musical experience where people were singing along, we shared a meal together. Um, you know, it was such a small apartment, people were on the floor. Um, is definitely one of the more significant ones. I mean, it's great to go out to a restaurant or a bar together, but there's just something about going to somebody's house that seems a bit more personable. I think the first thing that people worry about is the instrument. So the first thing I usually tell people is it's extremely easy to learn. (laughs) Um, I'm super dyslexic and I've always had a hard time with reading Western notation, so I really love it's just intuitive. It's set up in like the circle of fifths and all the notes are labeled like easy, easy, easy. I mean, it's kind of interesting because yes, we use sheet music for every song, but a lot of the songs end up being taught by road anyways, because the people that aren't as familiar with or comfortable with sheet music will often just ask another person in the band to play a part and then they'll learn it by ear. Like, uh, I think it was last semester. Uh, one of the members just (laughs) randomly said that they didn't know how to read sheet music and everyone looked at them like, wait, then how have you been playing this whole time? And they've just been learning by rote the whole time and it's working for them, so. Yeah, it's it's just a community where it draws people to it too. Like, you take like something like First Friday, for example, when we play at First Friday, we always amass a huge crowd. I think people are drawn to that. Like this, our little community, and we always have people say we love this so much, and then we always, then we, we sometimes we get those people back like during the school year, and like it's people who are interested in joining this group, and that's the whole like thing about Burns Deal. I feel like it's a community, but it can't like it's ever expanding too. The more like people we express what what Burns Deal is too the more it'll expand. So it'll just be ever, it's just never growing community, honestly. I had trouble forming more friendships with people who I didn't know already. So outside of that little group of friends, I didn't really know new college people. Um, I think once I started joining this organization and others, uh, but Maroon Steel definitely helped create new friendships. I definitely would if I see someone, uh, someone else from the group, like around campus or anything, I, you know, say I talk to them a little bit. I really like how everybody kind of gets along, and nobody is very judgmental here. Like I feel like a lot of us are very different people, but we all get along and we all come together twice a week and hang out and have a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Do you think that affects how we play in any way? Yeah. I think it helps us play like more together and like listen to each other and nobody's really trying to like outshine everybody else. If you're all good friends and you see the guy next to you jamming out, you're like, oh, okay, my friend's jamming out, I'm gonna jam out too. And you're just gonna make yourself sound better doing that as well. I mean, you know, I'd say I call it community because I see any one of those people in, you know, in this band outside of practice and I can walk up to him and have a conversation with him, say, you know, treat him just like any other friend I have. So, uh, heck, I, I see uh, Matthew outside the Labar's building all the time on the way back from, from engineering. So, uh, you know, I, I'd say it definitely is. I mean, we, we do a lot of stuff together. We perform together. We, we learn together. We progress together in our musical abilities. And yeah. outside of practice, you know, everyone's a friend. It's, mm-hmm. it's been good. I mean, it's not just a community, but it's more of a family by any means, you know. I mean, a community, sure, it's just a bunch of people living together or a bunch of animals living together or whatever you, you know, want to call it. And it's just like, but family, there's something deeper about that, you know. 
community has always been an important aspect of steel bands. Through the tumultuous history of Trinidadian musical styles and iterations, something has survived that is present in steel bands today. The hand drums and other musical stylings brought over from West Africa that make up the foundation for the steel pan had a profound effect on what would follow, specifically the significance those instruments held to those enslaved in Trinidad. Taken away from their tribes, those instruments served as a signifier of home, as a way for the slaves to maintain some kind of connection to their homeland, and as an idea to gather around and form community. This importance has been passed down through musical practice. In steel bands, practices, customs, and traditions like liming, learning by rote, and costuming have been essential in the transmission of this importance and to the formation of community to each new generation of pan players throughout the world.